this morning, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, let me get all of these pages, beginning in chapter 25, the, the title of the message today is, What to Expect from Relationships. How many of you have ever had a relationship that didn't go quite the way you thought it was supposed to? Yeah, all God's children said, Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, I remember in high school, how many of you remember falling in love in high school? Yes. It didn't go quite the way you expected. How many of you are here, are right now married to your high school sweetheart? Anybody? One, two, three? Four, well, I'm afraid yeah, I'm counting I'm counting you too. I've gotten, I've gotten too. <laughs> so that's a pretty small, per, small percentage, I'll get it right, that's a pretty small percentage of relationships that went the way they had hoped. I know all that we fall in. I fell in love. My mind, was, my brain was scrambled. I had, I mean, it, I just wasn't right. And it was all because I thought I knew the relationship I had was it. And that we had, we had this relationship. And how many of you know, uh, there comes a time when somebody in that relationship says, you know what, today isn't your day, and tomorrow ain't looking too good. <laughs> I've heard that a few times in a few different ways. But what to expect from relationships, and with that, I'm convinced, in America anyways, we do not understand what a covenant is. What is a covenant? So for the next few weeks, we're going to be discussing what it is to have a covenant with God, and a covenant with man, and how really both of them are a, a bond that is not supposed to be broken. Now if you look with me in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 25, <coughs> beginning in verse 10, it says, all, everybody say all, all. good, all the paths, and all means all, or it means nothing at all. Right. All means all, or it means nothing at all. And right here it says, All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. How many of you know there's always qualifiers to every statement? All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. How many of you know it might be important for us to know what his covenant is? Because it says, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. Do you want God's paths for your life to be loving kindness and truth? Yes. Yeah. Hello? <laughs> Do you want loving kindness and truth to be the relationship that you have with God? With that, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant. And if we don't know what a covenant is, if we don't appreciate and understand that covenant relationship, we can be in trouble to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should choose. His soul will abide in Prosperity. How many of you want your soul to, to abide in prosperity? That's not to say all there's going to be a, I'm not, I'm not the fortune cookie, a windfall is coming your way. If you just open this email address, Jack, Jack helped me out on that this week. We got a new program a while back for the church and something came in the email. Say, and it said Apple, and I should have picked up, we don't have an Apple. But it said, your new Apple program, all you have to do is click on this. And I, I forwarded it to Jack and said, uh, uh, is it scam? What is it? And he, yep, it's a good thing you didn't click on that. You've been in trouble. And, and you know, th those, those <clears throat> scams that the enemy pulls on us about what prosperity really is. And I'll tell you what. For my soul to prosper, everything else is good. To know that I know that I know that I've been born again. To know that I know that I know that Jesus Christ 
has saved me and washed me and made me new. To know that I know that I know that soon and very soon I'm going to meet him. I'm going to be in his presence. That's what prosperity of the soul is. And when my soul is prosperous, how many of you know from the innermost parts of a man, that's where everything else comes from? The Bible tells us that's our down, deep down within us. And as, as when I'm right in the Lord, the soul, his soul will be in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. Not only spiritual, but financial. God will bless. And listen to this, verse 14. The secret of the Lord. How many of you like secrets? Come on. Somebody, remember the E.F. Hutton? When E.F. Hutton speaks. <laughs> when we start, oh, I got a secret. I'm going to tell you a secret. Everybody gets quiet. And that's what it says right here. The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know, know his covenant. The secrets of of the Lord is for those who fear him and he will make them know his covenant. <clears throat> this morning, what is the secret of walking with the Lord? Walking is as Enoch walked. Remember that? We talked about him, I believe, last week, just briefly. It says in Genesis chapter 5, verse 22, then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Man, can you imagine that? I mean, I'm not afraid of dying. It's just how it's going to happen. It's got me a little concerned. I know that once, once, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I'm not afraid of dying. It's how it's going to happen. To be able to just be transformed, that's why I'm praying for the rapture. I want, I want the trumpet to sound. I want to have the presence of mind to do the Superman pose. I want to go to heaven. I want to be on top of it. I want to be ready for, for the trumpet to sound. But can you imagine to have lived a life that was so incredible before God that God said, you're not going to die. You're not going to be taken in the rapture. I'm just going to come and take you, and you're going to be with me, and nobody's going to know what happened to you. It says in Hebrews 5.11, by faith, and that's so important, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. To have that kind of a relationship. Noah had a covenant relationship with God. Genesis 6, 9 says, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Wow. And as you consider all the others, you look at Abraham, he walked with God, and God said, wherever you put your foot as you walk, that's going to be, that's going to be long to you and your descendants. Looking at Moses and where he walked through the wilderness. And God said, where you walk is going to take you and all those people to the promised land. To live that kind of life. Walking as David walked, a man after God's own heart. What would you give to be able to know the secret of walking with God? The secret this morning, I'm going to let you in on it, is knowing God's covenant. Again, Psalm 25, 14 says, The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them know his covenant. Father, this morning, before we can know your covenant, we've got to understand what a covenant is. And Father, I pray that you would put away all our preconceived ideas and notions of what a covenant with you, what a covenant with others is all about, and help us to learn from you, our teacher. Teach our hearts. Help us to understand. Clear away all the clouds of confusion that the enemy would put in our mind's eye and help us to see with clarity you and all your glory and the importance of having a real covenant.
relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I was going to ask, how many of you here could say, I have a clear understanding of covenant, but I don't think many of us do. I don't even know that I've got a completely clear understanding of covenant, and I've been studying this and, and putting it together. Yet, we receive the benefits of God's covenant without knowing why we have them. We testify that we are completely forgiven, but if we don't have a real covenant relationship with God, do we understand what forgiveness, true forgiveness, is really all about? Do we have a solid foundation for making the statement that says, I have been born again? Do we really believe that we are completely forgiven? That's the question this morning. Do you believe that you have been complete? When you come before God and you say, wash me, Lord. When you come into his presence and say, Father, forgive me. Wash me with the blood of Christ. Let, let all my, my sins be washed away and make me new again. Do you truly believe that you have been completely forgiven? If we did, if we really believe that we are completely forgiven, would we so easily fall back into sin? That's one of the things that covenant does. Those that are locked into a covenant relationship know just what that means to be locked in. The Bible is a covenant book. And to understand covenant means that your faith will be transformed. So what is covenant? As I begin studying it, and as we look back on this, first, it's a blood bond for life and death. How many of you remember the old Lone Ranger movies and things? Oh, Kimosabi, give me your hand. They cut the hand, they cut the other hand, they put their hands together. That's part of a covenant relationship. That's biblical. And as we, we consider that, it's made between two people or two peoples. It requires the shedding of blood and an oath. And it is a blood bond for life and death. It's making a binding statement that I am tied to you by blood in a life or death relationship. I can never get out of this. I want you to think about that. That, that shedding of blood, that coming together and being one with the other. It says, I can never get out of this relationship that I'm entering into. Second, in our Bible covenant, God is the one who makes the covenant. How many of you are glad you don't have to make the covenant? God makes the covenant. God is the one who has taken the initiative to make this covenant with man. The word covenant, from languages close to Hebrew, defines it as to clasp, to fetter with chains, to hold together a binding statement. A covenant is a binding statement with God. An unbreakable contract. An unbreakable. Have you ever bought something and after you signed on the dotted line you had a little bit of buyer's remorse? Even something that was wonderful, just, just having that knowledge of, ooh, I'm tied to this now. This is a done deal. You know, I've noticed, what, how many of you have ever noticed like me, whenever you finally get a nice car, everybody pulls out in front of you. Everybody, everybody cuts you off. I just realized this is I'm going to turn this off. Everybody turns in front of you. As a matter of fact, we've got a, a new vehicle. We're driving down 13. As we're coming down 13, I noticed uh, there was a, a, a storage place, and somebody had put mattresses out by the road. Not the little big king or queen size mattresses, box spring mattress out by the road. And as we're driving, you remember last week how windy it was? And as I was driving along, I looked up, and the top mattress began to quiver. <laughs> oh, no. And it's too late. And up it came, right? And, and I was able, 
no oncoming traffic, so I was able to maneuver around it at the last minute. I felt like Richard Petty or somebody like that. <laughs> but it just seems like whenever you get something new, it, there's, there's in something good, you just have the, everything's against it, and you're thinking, oh, did I make a mistake here? That covenant relationship, it is something that is unbreakable. It's not a casual relationship, and no casual, casual covenant ever existed. It says, if I fail to keep this covenant, I am saying I am ready to forfeit my life. There is no exit. That's what covenant is. And a covenant is binding. Joshua chapter 9, verse 1 says, Now it came about when all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland and on the coast of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites heard of it. And they gathered themselves together with one accord to fight with Joshua and with Israel. When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and all Ai, they also acted craftily. The other nations came with, said, we're going to fight against these Israelites that are just whooping on everybody that are going to their promised land. But, but these Gibeons said they also acted craftily and set out as envoys and took worn out sacks on their donkeys and wineskins worn out and torn and mended and worn out and packed sandals on their feet and worn out clothes on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and had become crumbled. They went to Joshua, to the camp of Gilgal, and said to him and to all and to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now therefore make a covenant with us. They lived just down the road, but they made themselves look like they had traveled forever. And they said, We're from a faraway place, now make a covenant with us. They lied. But they wanted to make a covenant. Joshua 9, 12 says, This our bread was warm when we took it out for provision out of our houses on the day that we left to come to you. But now behold, it is dry and has become crumbled. These wine skins which were filled were new. And behold, they are torn. And these are clothes and sandals are worn out because of the very long journey. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions and did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. That's a key sign right there. Before you make a covenant, make sure you've heard from God. Verse 15, Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore an oath to them. And verse 16 says, It came about at the end of three days after they had made the covenant with them that they heard that they were neighbors and they were living within their land. The, now, as you look at this, the other tribes hear that Jacob was, was tricked and now wouldn't be willing to, to wipe out the Gibeonites as God had commanded. So they rallied together to fight against them. So the, the, the other tribes that, that God blessed were coming against them. And the Gibeonites cried out to Joshua and said, Remember our covenant. Save us. All these people, it wasn't, um, I, I apologize, it wasn't good, people of God, it was the other people that had come against Israel. They realized that Israel made a covenant with these Gibeonites. They said, well, we've we got to take them out, but they'll fight with them. And the Gibeonites cried out and said, remember our covenant. Save us. The Gibeonites made this under false pretenses. How many of you know, sometimes you, you make contracts, you make deals, and the other person has false pretenses, but your word is still your word. And they cried out and said, save us. And Joshua, even though he'd been lied to, God had sent him to wipe out these people. But total deception came in. Yet Joshua basically said, I'm in a covenant. I'm stuck. I have to help these people. And later, due to that covenant, God brought about some great uh, natural re uh, miracles recorded in the Bible. As Joshua kept the covenant and protected those people that fooled him, God blessed him, even though he went into a covenant the wrong way. First, God destroyed the greatest part of an overpowering, invading army with a huge hailstorm of hail coming down and just wiping them out. Second, after this, Israel was winning, 
And in Joshua chapter 10, verse 12, then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said to the, in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon, in the valley of Agedalon. So the sun stood still. How many of you knew that? God caused the sun to stand still, and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. It is not written, is it not written in the book of Jeshar? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. There was no day like it before it or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. As we, we look at this, this story, and it's not just a story, it happened. These people came in and they put together a false narrative and Joshua and the Israelites bought it hook, line, and sinker and they, they established a covenant with them and even after they found they had been deceived, they kept their covenant with these people and because of that, God blessed them and brought about an incredible miracle, not only killing a huge portion of the army coming against them with hailstones, they didn't even have to fight, but when they were fighting and they were being victorious, but they knew the day was going to come to a close and they weren't going to get all the fighting done and they were going to have problems because of that, Joshua stood up and said, Lord, stop the sun right now. And God caused the sun to stop in its tracks for a day while they finished this battle. You talk about God appreciating obedience and keeping covenant. God understands covenant, and we need to appreciate that fact. So how is the covenant made? I, I covered this several months back. I want to bring it back to our attention. A covenant is made by two people or two tribes, generally. In this illustration, tribe A and tribe B. Now, in this illustration, tribe A is an intelligent group of people, maybe they're scientists or, or whatever their, their field is, business, they are incredibly intelligent and they are able to make all kinds of money, but they don't know one end from the other of a sword. So every time they make money, a marauding army comes in and beats them up and takes their lunch money and leaves. Tribe B, these are a bunch of vicious brutes that they fight, that's how they get along, and anybody that, that crosses one of them, crosses them all because they're going to stand up and they are just a warring faction. But they have very little money because the only thing they have is what they take from other people. So tribe B and tribe A come together and they say, we want to make a covenant together. Tribe A will provide the resources for their intelligence to bring about commerce and give us a good good uh, economic base to work from. Tribe B will be our military and our police, and we will make sure that, that everything is protected and everyone does what they're supposed to do. So they come together. And as these tribes realize they need each other, they make a covenant together. First of all, each tribe selects a representative. In our lives, living for God, he chose Jesus Christ. Each tribe chooses a representative, and the representative comes forth. The representative represents the entire tribe, and what happens to him happens to all of them. The representatives meet before both tribes. They exchange weapons. The, the, the intelligence guy, maybe he hands a book, or maybe, I, what's, that, what's that gadget that came before calculators? Abacus. 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 That's it. Maybe he has one of those. And the brute, the, he comes out, maybe he's got a shield, or maybe he's got a spear or a sword. And so they bring their weapons out, and they exchange their weapons. They would also exchange their coats. What, how many of you know what you wear has a determining factor on people figuring out what you do for a living? If you come in with a star on your chest, and a holster on your side, people are going to think, oh, police officer. 
If you come in with a, a lab coat on and a stethoscope, I'll get all these words right, around your neck, they're going to, oh, you are a nurse or a doctor, you're in the medical field. And so they would come in with their coat and they would take their coat and they would exchange coats with one another. Then the covenant animal was sacrificed, it was brought in and killed, it was split down the middle, nose to tail. It was separated in between them, laid out with a space in the middle that was filled with the blood of the animal that poured in. Then the two, the two representatives would stand on either side of that animal and they would begin a figure eight and as they walked through, they faced each other. And then they would continue on in that figure eight, and each time coming through, they would face each other. As they walked through the bowels of death and blood, they would be reminded of who this covenant is for, one another. And as the representatives walked through that path, it reminded them that it was all about infinity, continuing on. And as they went their separate ways in that figure eight, they would end up once again facing each other, standing in the middle of the divided animal. As the entrails are there, as the blood is there, signifying, we stand in the bowels of death together. As you can understand, this isn't a casual relationship. This is a relationship to life. It says, if I break this covenant, I die. And they would read the terms of the covenant. Then a vital part of the covenant would take place. The palm of the right hand was cut deeply, causing blood to fill the hand. Then the two representatives would come together, hands down, filling with blood. They would reach out and they would shake hands with a handful of blood. After the blood mingled, they were considered blood brothers. And afterward, they would work the scar, causing it to raise and to be obvious to everyone. A lot of times they would walk through the community showing the scar. If there were concerns that people weren't keeping their part of the covenant, it wasn't a problem for the person that made the covenant to walk through the opposing side and show that scar and remind them, we are in covenant agreement with one another. Then there was an exchange of names. Tribe A would become Tribe AB, and Tribe B would become Tribe BA. And from that time on, they were called friends. The friend was only used by those who entered into a covenant relationship in the Old Testament. Those that could call themselves a friend of God were in covenant with God. And as we consider this, this fact, John 15, verse 15, says, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. I am in covenant with you. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Covenant. That, that blood covenant of combining it together and saying, I am in this until I die. You can count on me. And you might say, well, Pastor, why, why is it important for me to understand covenant? We try to make covenants all the time. But because we don't understand them, they aren't kept. We make a covenant with our children, hopefully even before they're born. I started praying for my children before they were born, my granddaughter before she was born, and begin making that covenant with them. But, that I will be there for them. And even when you tick me off, I will love you. 
And even when you make huge mistakes, I may not fix them, but I will help you. Because I'm in covenant with you. When we've come together as husband and wife, and we make that promise to one another, for us to begin to understand, and if you think about it, even that's a blood covenant. And as we come together and we make a promise that says, I will be there. We are bound together. I will always love you, no matter what you do. If we begin to appreciate what the covenant is about, the relationship with God, a blood covenant that before Jesus Christ was the, the, the best sacrifice that you could come up with and blood that was shed to cover sin but that wasn't the covenant yet that was just a precursor a help to get us to that and then once Jesus Christ died, the perfect, spotless lamb, he who knew no sin, and he shed his blood, and let me tell you something, you want to talk about scars to remind us of the covenant. I think that's why Jesus showed them his hand. We think it was all about Thomas bringing proof to him, but Jesus wanting us to know that he was scarred for us. That covenant relationship that Jesus says, I love you so much, not only that I will die for you, but I did die for you. Are we in covenant relationship with him? Or we will say, I love you so much, I will die for you. This morning, we're going to be celebrating communion. representation of that covenant that God has made between you, between me, and God. And before we go to that point, I just want to let you know, if you are here today, maybe you don't believe you've been in that covenant relationship with God that He's designed. Before we even begin to distribute the emblems, I want you to consider, do I have that covenant relationship? Am I living with God the way He desires me to live? Am I in covenant relationship with God? today. Wash our minds as it were through the, the water of the world. Are we 
fully in covenant relationship with you, Lord. Are we in covenant relationship with you? Saying, Lord, even if it costs me my life, This relationship will stay. Holy Spirit, I pray that you are filling this place like never before. We aren't looking for an emotional feeling. Lord, we just want to, to experience your touch. this covenant that we have with the Lord. Would you stand with me this morning? And if you just come to the center aisle and you begin to receive of the end.
this covenant relationship that we're celebrating this morning. The shedding of blood. The scarring. Maybe you're here today and you would say, I need to have a greater appreciation for the covenant that God has made with me. And I need to have a greater appreciation for the covenant that God has called me to have with others. This morning, part of that covenant was Jesus' body being broken. We're going to pray and ask God to bless this as we receive. Help us to appreciate His love and our lives. Father, for this bread that represents the body of Jesus Christ, publicly broken so that I could have a covenant relationship with you. Lord, now I pray in Jesus' name that we will appreciate not only what Jesus went through for us, but why he went through it for us. To have that relationship that cannot be broken. A relationship to last for an eternity. Father, I thank you that your covenant with us has nothing to do with how you feel. Because you keep your word no matter what. Father, help us to appreciate covenant. Because we need to keep our word. Now, Lord, thank you for the body of Christ who was broken for me, for us. Bless each of us as we receive. And help us, Lord, as we receive to enter more fully into that covenant relationship that you desire. In Jesus' name. Let's receive together. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for those scars that will remind us through eternity of the power of covenant and the importance of that covenant. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. As we take the cup, reminding us of the blood it was poured out for this covenant to be made complete. Father, thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you that it brings about a completeness in our covenant with you. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you will give us a greater appreciation for the blood of Jesus Christ. That as it came forth, flowing down his arms, and flowing from his side, flowing from the wounds that covered his body, that blood is what washes us and completes the covenant between you and us. Bless the cup, I pray, this morning, Father, and help us to appreciate the power of the blood of Christ. In Jesus' name, let's receive together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you have agreed with us. That you have, have made this covenant.
contract with us that is completely binding. Lord, help us to live up to our end and to stay within your covenant. Lord, I know the only way that we are released from the covenant is if we walk away. Father, help us to never walk away from you. Your arms of love, your covering, your solid foundation that we can be found in. Father, this morning, not only do we thank you for the covenant that we have with you, our salvation and our life, but Father, the covenant that you put between us as the body of Christ, Help us to, to have a covenant relationship. Lord, not one of flightiness, if it's not my way, I'm going the highway, but one that says, no matter what, I am going to work together with you to see us become the body of Christ that God has called us to be. Father, there is no careless covenant. but only one of, of truth and strength and purity. Lord, I pray for our homes, the marriages in this church, that we will grasp covenant, that we will live covenant. Father, for, for every husband in this place, that they will esteem their wife, that they will love them as you have called them to, and they will keep their covenant with them. Father, for every wife, that they will respect their husbands, that they will, will reach out to them in love and honor. Lord, that, that we will have that healthy covenant relationship in every way. Now, Father, I pray a covering over each one. And I speak a blessing in each heart and each life. The blessing of walking in covenant with Almighty God. Father, that is the greatest blessing I could pray upon anyone. And I pray that into each heart and into each life. Walking in covenant with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a covenant that each side says, I will die before I will allow this covenant to end. I will not break this covenant, but I will live this covenant out. Now, Father, I speak that blessing upon each one. Lord, we receive your blessing today from you. We give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. Lord, help us now to be able to expect not only from you, but from one another. Covenant relationship that we can count on each one. In Jesus' precious name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.